910 Ministries podcast, No Trash, Just Truth, with hosts Chris Paxson and Rose Spiller. At Proverbs 910 Ministries, we are dedicated to taking out the trash of false teaching and replacing it with biblical truth. Welcome back. We've delved into quite a lot in the last seven episodes. And just a reminder, everything ties together. They're all part of being a whole Christian and are all directly tied to our theme verse for this series, Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that by testing, you may discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In this episode and the next episode, the journey in our transformation is taking a slightly different, yet no less connected turn. And we're going to say up front that this episode and the next one are pretty hard hitting, so you might want to buckle up. Along with grasping the greatness and goodness of God and the incredible rewards and fruit we receive from being one of God's elect, we also need to be aware of and understand the forces that are against us, the world, the flesh, and Satan. And as we've said several times, Chris, the world and our flesh rarely need any help from Satan to fall into sin. But as we've also looked at, those who do not belong to God are wicked at their core and they have Satan as their master. And we need to be aware of that. That's why they're referred to as the wicked in scripture in verses like Daniel 12, 10. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And it's them who Isaiah is referring to when he says in Isaiah 5, 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You can call them the world, the wicked, unbelievers, whatever. Paul gives a very graphic description of them in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And we see it. Quite a list, and we certainly do mm-hmm. say it. Mm-hmm. And we've been seeing it since the time of Jesus' ascension. Many of our brothers and sisters throughout the world have seen this, and they live with this on a daily basis. Their whole lives they've lived with this. For us in the United States, in Canada, Europe, and other parts of the West, it's been more subtle for the past few decades. Although we've certainly seen prejudice against Christians and mocking of God, we've also enjoyed relative freedom to worship Jesus and freely express our faith. For us, the hate's been subtle. However, that subtlety is no more. Now everywhere, Christians are in a full-on assault, having evil thrust at us and forced upon us. Here's just one example. We googled, is wickedness a sin? And here's the top answer that came up. No. I went on to say, sin can either refer to a specific behavior prohibited by a religion or a state, a condition where one is out of grace. Wickedness just means being evil. Sin, very generally, is a choice or act to disobey God. And that's the end of the quote. The most prevalent way the world calls evil good and good evil is to brainwash and indoctrinate people. And one of the ways that they do that is to moralize sin. They make sin seem normal, or at least make it not seem like it's such a big deal. Just look at what Big Tech did here with this. Wickedness is just being evil. It's not a sin. Sin is intentionally choosing to disobey God. So if you're evil, but you aren't intentionally choosing to disobey God, you aren't sinful, Besides that being a blatant lie, it doesn't even make any sense. But making sense isn't what these people today are about. No, not at all, as we're going to say. So what do we do about it? How can we be transformed to handle the onslaught of evil being touted as good and true good being denounced as evil? Is it even possible to fight against the evil, stand firm in biblical truth, and glorify God in our reaction all at the same time? 
Jesus tells us that it is, but we need to be prepared. In Matthew 24, 9 to 14, he says, you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake, and then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. We're going to spend the next two episodes on this. People, groups, governments, Christians, and even pastors and churches that are celebrating what they call good, but what is in reality evil. Things that are in direct opposition to God's word. We need to arm ourselves with biblical truth because make no mistake about it, anyone who puts themselves in direct opposition of God is an enemy of God. And therefore, they're going to be an enemy of ours. James 4.4 4 says anyone who makes friends with the world is an enemy of God's. Like you said, Chris, sad as it is, there are a lot of professing Christians in churches who are embracing friendship with the world at the expense of the truth of God. It's imperative that we're educated about and that we're aware of what we're up against so that we can stand firm in our faith when we need to. We need to be transformed to have the courage and the ability to call out evil as evil. You know, who knows if God will use our faith and courage to help transform others, maybe bring a wayward Christian back to repentance, or maybe even be a part of bringing an unbeliever to faith in Jesus. Yeah, tr that truly happens all the time, and we hope that it really does. Yep. You know, those who hate God and hate us are attacking the very truths of God. They're perverting his word, and they're mocking him. And sometimes it's coming from within the church. And we know that that's a pretty bold statement to make. So let's look at exactly how that's happening. We're going to start with how the world is trying to destroy the family. And this is a complex plan that includes attacking it on several forms and in several different ways. And that includes redefining marriage, devaluing parenting, questioning our identity, and indoctrinating our children, of course. Yep. And Chris, speaking of bold statements, I'm going to make another one. The radical left is trying to destroy the nuclear family so that they can destroy family ties and teaching and make atheists out of the next generation. And I can already picture some of you getting ready to type out a derogatory comment to us or shoot us an angry email. But before you do, just listen to the rest of the episode. First, just to define nuclear family, it's a it's a universal definition. It's not a Christian thing. It's to a two-parent household, a mother and a father, and their biological children. So let's start with a little known fact about the organization BLM and understand we're talking about the organization Black Lives Matter, not the sentiment that Black Lives Matter. Of course they do. Although it's been taken down, last October, the website of the Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation blatantly stated its desire to dismantle the nuclear family. It said, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another. That's the end of their quote. Among other reasons listed was the need to destroy heterosexual domain. Despite their rhetoric about their mission being to crush white supremacy, BLM's ultimate goal is to create a new world order, a Marxist dystopia, and that requires the destruction of the traditional family and the abandonment of traditional values. They can't do it otherwise. This was an article from The Atlantic in March 2020 titled, The Nuclear Family Was a Mistake. That's the title. It's a long article, but they sum it up in one line. The family structure we've held up as the cultural idea for the past half century has been a catastrophe for many. It's time to figure out better ways to live together. And that's the end of quote. Just an FYI, Atlantic, the family structure has not just been held up as the cultural ideal for the past 50 years. It's been held up as the cultural ideal since creation. Exactly. Another article used stats to show that the nuclear family is on the outs. In 1970, 40% of couples were married with children. 2013, 
marked a low of only 19% of households married with children. They say the nuclear family is rapidly on a decline in the US and other parts of the West due to couples living together and not marrying, couples not having kids, high divorce rates, and the rise of LGBTQT families. And here's a statement that Google just anonymously throws out there. And I'm quoting, negative effects of the nuclear family include the isolation and emotional dependency of the husband-wife and parent-child relationship, which produces tensions and may lead to marriage breakdown in the former instance and juvenile delinquency and other juvenile problems in the latter. And that's the end of the quote. Now, this is very perplexing because the Heritage Foundation did an extensive research paper titled The Breakdown of Marriage, Family, and Community. And here's what they concluded. Over the past 30 years, the rise in violent crime parallels the rise in families abandoned by fathers and high crime neighborhoods are characterized by high concentrations of families abandoned by fathers. On the other hand, the Heritage Foundation found that neighborhoods with a high degree of religious practice are not high crime neighborhoods. And even in high crime neighborhoods, inner city neighborhoods particularly, well over 90% of kids who come from safe, stable homes do not become juvenile delinquents. By contrast, only 10% of those kids that are in unsafe, unstable homes in the same neighborhoods avoid becoming juvenile delinquents. So you got 90% from stable homes compared to 10% from unstable. They say a mother's strong affectionate attachment to her child is the child's best buffer against a life of crime, but also a father's authority and involvement in raising his kids is also a great buffer. All over the world and throughout history, families have been the source of economic and social stability. Particularly in the West, two-parent nuclear families are leading preventers of poverty and abuse. A February 2020 article in The Atlantic found that, and I'm quoting here, children living in a household with an unrelated adult were about nine times more likely to be physically, sexually, or emotionally abused than children raised in an intact nuclear family. And that's the end of their quote. So even secular research shows that destroying the nuclear family and replacing it with a community of collective strangers is not only not a good idea, it's potentially very dangerous and damaging to children. So what does the Bible have to say about family and the importance of it? Well, first, people were identified in the ancient world by their family. Peter, he also called Simon, is called Simon, son of Jonah. Joshua says, Joshua, son of Nun from the tribe of Ephraim, etc. Matthew and Luke make it a point to trace Jesus's family all the way back to Abraham on Joseph's side and Adam on Mary's side. So family mattered. It still matters. In Genesis 18, 19, God says about Abraham, for I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he's promised him. God tells Moses, instruct the Israelites to pass the law down to their children and instruct them on the ways of the Lord so they don't fall into idolatry and sin. Proverbs exhorts us to train our children, teach them about God so that they'll have the best chance of staying in the faith. And of course, the biggest argument that God is pro-family is that when we're saved, we become part of a family of God. A family that's going to last forever and ever and can never be broken up or destroyed. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. And Romans 8, 14 to 16 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and of children, then heirs. Right. We're not a village. No. We We're said not God's that, village. That's right. We're God's family, not his village. We said that the attack on the family is multifaceted. And one way they attack it is by attacking the very foundation of the family, marriage. 
Dismantling marriage is one of the quickest ways to destroy a family, sadly, as many of us know. One attack that's being waged against marriage is called egalitarianism. That's the idea that women can do anything men can do. Women and men are interchangeable. Now, on the surface, many might think, well, what's wrong with that? That doesn't seem evil. Men and women should be equal. We went into depth in this in our episode on radical feminism. But Chris, why don't we give a summary and why this is an evil being called good and how it's destroying the family? Well, Genesis 127 says that God created both men and women in his image. That means that they are both of the same worth in God's eyes. One is not superior to the other. However, they're not equal. Men and women have been given different strengths for the purpose of glorifying God, for helping encourage and sanctify each other, for strengthening families, for building up the church. And God is most glorified, Christians are most edified, and the family is the securest and the church the strongest when men and women are operating in their biblical roles. And like you said, we did go into this in radical feminism, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail here, but why it's evil is because from creation, God has given equal worth to men and women, Jesus especially. He lifted up women to show that God deeply values and cares for them. However, men and women are given different roles, roles that glorify God and build up the church But not only has the world rejected that notion, over the last 70 years, the narrative has gone from women can do anything that men can do to women don't even need men for much of anything except for maybe to be a sperm donor or to watch the kids. Men are helpers at best and at worst bumbling idiots, if you watch any TV or anything, who need a woman to tell them what to do just to get through their day. Here's a quote from an article on a liberal website that's titled, What's wrong with mainstream Christianity gender roles? And here's the quote. Men are always awarded power, authority, and dominance. Women are relegated to the roles of service, nurturing, and adoration. And non-binary or gender non-conforming people aren't even recognized. This needs to change. The end of the quote. Notice the twisting of the words here. This is a huge lie wrapped in a measly strand of truth that men are given authority in scripture and women are nurturing, both of which is true, but the rest is all lies. And just to note, Chris, of course, non-binary and gender non-conforming people aren't recognized. Hello? (laughs) I knew you were gonna say that. (laughs) Have you noticed on TV shows, movies, commercials, that men often chide each other, but never do they chide a woman. Women are never portrayed as ever being wrong, or having weaknesses. Even in commercials, it's always the man that's that does things wrong. But women have no problem chiding men. They take great joy in pointing out men's weaknesses and shortcomings and mistakes. And the men meekly accept it, even thanking them for it. And this is even true within the confines of marriage. Although more and more, marriage between a man and a woman is rarely portrayed. That's true. We've turned the healthy, godly relationship between a man and a woman that God graciously gave us into a war zone. Colossians 3, 18 to 21 says under the heading of roles for Christian households, wives submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. A godly marriage which God invented and defined is a wife letting her husband fill the role that he's called to leader, protector, provider, and a husband to let his wife fill the role that she was called to by loving her and supporting her in it. The point is not that one is superior or better than the other. The point is that both are committed to each other and both are looking to God as their authority and both are practicing sacrificial love by putting their spouse's best interests first. The Institute for Family Studies posted a research paper recently on modern marriage. It said that more and more marriages are becoming less institutionalized, meaning like a partnership, and more individualistic. And here's a quote from their paper. Spouses are more and more likely to do things like live apart, keep their resources separate, have separate bank accounts, maintain separate social networks, 
opt not to have children with each other, maintain independent rather than interdependent paid work and caring roles, have separate family names, and not consider their marriage a permanent relationship. Such behaviors make it possible for spouses to maintain independence, personal freedom, and a unique identity that is separate from their spouse. This is important for fulfilling individual goals and needs while in the relationship, but it also makes it easier to leave the relationship if and when desired, end quote. Over the past two generations, people have spent less and less time in marriage. They're marrying later, if at all, and they're divorcing more. And in 1960, 72% of American adults were married. In 2017, nearly half of American adults were single. Four-fifths of American adults in 2019 Pew Research Center's survey said that getting married is not essential to living a fulfilling life. And even amongst those who do marry, things are changing. In 2012, even, most American family households had no children. There are more American homes with pets than children. And of course, you don't necessarily have to be married to have a fulfilling life. That's not the point. But 80% think that, that's pretty high. Yeah, it is. We only have to watch TV or the movies to see that this is being promoted. Less and less are we seeing traditional marriages and families. Instead, men and women relationships are more likely to be shown as a once in a while pastime activity. Maybe they're living together. Maybe they're having an affair on their spouses or they're divorced. And I say men and women relationships because any of us who own a TV knows that the predominant relationship that is more and more being promoted is homosexual. And ironically, it's these relationships that are portrayed as loving and committed. It seems like there's more monogamous homosexual marriages portrayed in the media than heterosexual ones. A Gallup poll just last February, February, 2021, said that 5.6% of the population identifies as LGBTQ tick. Really? Because going by the homosexual relationships on TV, movies, commercials, I would have guessed that to be at least 50%. You're right. And if you wonder why that is, again, it's because they're moralizing sin. They're saturating the big and the small screens as well as books and articles with homosexuality and other things so that we will be completely desensitized to it. So our kids will grow up seeing it everywhere and think it's normal, acceptable, and good, and even darker by portraying homosexual relationships as stable and committed while heterosexual relationships are unstable, unequal, and often tense. It may lead our children into desiring a homosexual relationship over a heterosexual one. And this isn't by accident. No, not accident at all. Very intentional. We mentioned this a few episodes ago, but Canada's passed a new bill called the C4 bill, which prohibits what they call conversion therapy on the LGBTQT community. Pastor James Coates, who you might recognize as the clergyman who was jailed last year because he refused to close his church in what they called compliance with public health guidelines, told Fox News that this bill is anything but loving. It aims to shut the LGBTQT community off from the saving and transforming message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his quote. According to the text of the bill, conversion therapy is defined as a practice treatment or service designed to change a personal sexual orientation to heterosexual or to change a person's gender identity to cisgender. Critics of Bill C-4 say it is broadly worded and could even encompass private conversations about the topic, such as when a pastor or a Christian shares what the Bible actually teaches about sexuality. Notice the language, conversion therapy, something with very bad connotations. But in this bill, it means having a conversation with an LGBTQT person and showing them what the Bible says. That's what they consider it. Also notice that it's not against the law to try to persuade a heterosexual to be in the LGBTQT community. You can talk someone into being transgender or gay, but you can't talk someone who thinks they may be a homosexual or transgender about being a heterosexual. 
As John MacArthur puts it, the Canada law, if enforced in its broadest scope, would criminalize private conversations with people trying to help them with their homosexuality. Ultimately, the dissenters will be the ones who will not cave in. They'll be the ones who are faithful to the Bible. And Chris, there are those who claim to be Christians, even whole denominations that have caved on this, caved big time. There are. This is a statement from Covenant Network of Presbyterians. That's a PCUSA denomination or part of them. They're defending that homosexuality and same-sex marriage is biblically acceptable. And this is the quote. The good news, the gospel, always comes wrapped in culture, and it falls to us to sort out what is the good news and what is the culture. The Apostle Paul writes, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, Romans 8, 22. It is as if the gospel is being birthed, Paul writes, being birthed and coming into being amidst changing cultural norms and expectations. And it is our job to sort out what is the gospel from what is culture. And further, we should admit as Christians that similar arguments appealing to the Bible were used against interracial marriages, end of quote. And Chris, you said this, but it's worth repeating. This isn't just one pastor or one church. This is a statement from a network of PCUSA churches. We need to spend a minute on what they're saying because this is lie heaped on lie heaped on lie. First, the good news, the gospel is wrapped in culture. Ugh. Galatians 1, 6 to 9 puts it pretty clearly. Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And as we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. And that's the end of scripture. And speaking of Paul, the statement lies about Paul's words. The Romans 8 passage is not about groaning and birth pains of the gospel. And as we just saw in the verses you just read, Rose, God certainly doesn't need us to sort out the gospel. There is and has always been one gospel message. It's an essential truth. Scripture is completely clear on it. And there is absolutely no excuse to get it wrong. As far as Romans 8.22, you only need to read the verses directly before to know that Paul is talking about something different than the gospel. Romans 8.19-21 to says, For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in the glorious freedom from death and decay. That's the end. The groaning is creation groaning. Groaning because we live in a fallen world and creation is not as it should be. All of creation is longing for the time when Jesus comes back, reveals all who are his, and God reconstructs creation back to where it was always meant to be. And that has nothing to do with altering the gospel message to include homosexuality and same-sex marriage and calling it biblical. That's right. And cursed is the right word Paul used. He uses it twice. Yep. And the last lie, they say that Christians use the same biblical argument to oppose interracial marriages as they do for same-sex marriages. Now, I admit, I don't know if throughout history, there were some Christians who tried to make the case against interracial marriage using those same verses. If they did, they were wrong and they were just as much liars as this guy is. Nowhere in scripture, nowhere is there a prohibition against interracial marriage. We've talked about this before. The Bible makes no distinction between ethnicities. The only distinction is between believers and unbelievers. 
when the Israelites were told not to intermarry with the Canaanites and the Amorites and the rest of them, it wasn't because they were ethnically different. It was because they were pagan. We see in Exodus that some of the Egyptians converted to Judaism and joined the Israelites and left with them when they left. And that was completely fine and it was acceptable. So sorry to say, maybe not sorry to say, this guy who's speaking on behalf of a whole network churches is a clown. He's a clown entertaining the goats, as Charles Spurgeon says. Yeah. All right. So what does scripture say about homosexuality? Let's just talk about it. This, this is how God feels. This isn't us judging. This is how God feels. First Timothy 1, 10 and 11 says the law is for people who are sexually immoral or who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise breakers, or who do anything else to contradict the wholesome teaching that comes from the glorious good news entrusted to me by our blessed God. You know, Dr. Vody Bauckham says it all comes down to this. Hath God said, if God hasn't said, then we can debate and maybe even move the goalposts once in a while. If God has said, then there is absolutely no room for compromise. When it comes to homosexuality, God has clearly said, and he has said no. Right. And there are, of course, other passages that prohibit homosexuality, but we just don't have time to read them all. So what is the radical left's answer to this? They create a new Bible. They've created the Queen James Bible, which they also call the Gay Bible. It was published anonymously in 2012. It's based on the 1769 version of the King James Bible, and they chose Queen James as the title because they say King James was bisexual, so the term is appropriate. Now, we have no idea if he was bisexual or not, but King James didn't write the King James Bible. He commissioned biblical scholars to do it. Anyway, the editors of this Bible, who choose to be anonymous, claim that there was never a reference in the Bible to homosexuality until it was written in in 1946. Now, that's just a blatant lie. So what they've done is replace all the scripture that points to homosexuality and replaced it with different language. And Chris, just a question. If their Bible is based on the 1769 King James Version, why did they need to change the language if homosexuality wasn't in the Bible till 1946? That's a very, very good question. A very good question. I guess it's just because they wanted to call it the Queen James Bible. <laughs> and they didn't yes. really think past that. That's my guess. But let's just give a quick example of what, what is in that Bible. First Timothy, the, the first Timothy verse that we read, they've replaced it with this. For whoremongers, for them that defile themselves, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. What they've done with this verse and all the verses that they've changed is say the scripture is not talking about the physical act of homosexuality. It says they're referring to idol worship. Now, granted, there are several places where idol worship is likened to sexual sin. But when you look at the original text, when you look at the original language and context surrounding the scriptures, the verses that they changed were talking about physical, sexual immorality, homosexuality being one, not spiritual idolatry. That's right. And in the same sermon that you quoted, Chris, Dr. Vody Bauckham, who's never wanted to have difficulty standing firm in truth, said he's disgusted with how many pastors who, when they do preach on homosexuality, start off by qualifying their sermons with things like, now, I don't hate homosexuals, or I have a lot of wonderful friends and family who are homosexual, or things like that. He said, if you want to see how ridiculous this sounds, substitute adulterer for homosexual. Both are the same sin. So he says, and he does this, and it's actually pretty funny. Now, I don't hate adulterers. I have a lot of wonderful family and friends who are adulterers. It does sound crazy when you put it that way. Dr. Bauckham's point is not that we should hate those who are gay. Of course, we should not. And probably almost all of us do have family or friends that are homosexuals, and we do love them. The ridiculous part of it comes in when we waffle on God's truth of it. Rose, 
if you were an adulterer, I would not waffle with you. I would say, Rose, I love you, but you're sinning against God and your husband and you got to stop. I don't stop. think, I don't think there's many things that you would waffle on. I'm not a waffler. I would not use waffler as a term to describe you. That's for sure. <laughs> Never. That's a good Never. thing. You I, don't either, want, really. I don't want friends who are wafflers. <laughs> no, you're not a waffler either. Thanks. I'm more like a pancake. <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense. It doesn't, but we need to move on. <laughs> yeah. God created us. God gets to set the rules. God invented marriage. God gets to define it. God created sex. God gets to set the rules for that too. But the thing is, as with every rule God has set, it truly is what's best for us. It's best for our well-being. So how do we stand against the evil of homosexuality and adultery? You might as well throw that in there. They're the same. When it's so accepted and pervasive in our culture. Well, we can start by having the courage not to him and haw when asked if we're against them. Are we against same-sex marriage or homosexuality? Because we know it's going to cause controversy. Don't waffle because you know that you're going to have the world calling you hateful and bigoted. There is no doubt that when it comes to the LGBTQT agenda, the radical left is out for blood. Not only that, but they are trying to manipulate the world around us as much as they can, beginning with big tech. Usually if you Google verses on forgiveness, for example, something like that, the top site that comes up is Open Bible or Bible Study Tools. And there are some other similar sites. One of them comes up. These are sites that have organized scripture into categories, and you can quickly find out, you know, what you're looking for in a particular subject. But when you Google verses on homosexuality, the first five and a half pages, I'm saying pages, not the first five and a half sites, were all things like the Bible doesn't actually condemn homosexuality, or Jesus never condemned homosexuality. And that one kills me because these people just no, don't realize Jesus has been here forever too. I mean, he has <laughs> always been. He is, it's a triune God. So right. you're thinking God, the father of the Old Testament, mean old God and nice Jesus comes and ordains homosexuality as being fine. Wrong. That's, got, that's wrong. And the Holy Spirit wasn't going to divinely breathe out stuff that Jesus didn't believe in. <laughs> I know. And put it in the, I, it's just crazy. Anyway, finally, five and a half pages later, which is roughly 60 sites later, one of the verse sites that usually comes up first finally came up. Yeah. We're all in it together. So let's move on now to the T in LGBTQT agenda that's being celebrated as good and brave, and that's transgenderism. And just so we got our terms correct, a transgender is someone who identifies as the opposite of what they were born as. However, the only physical change they make to their body is either by taking estrogen or testosterone, depending on which gender they're pretending to be, or if they're prepubescent, they'll take puberty blockers and hormones, and that's to stop the natural puberty of their real gender. And just to, so we know all our terms, non-binary means they don't identify as either male or female. And the term they use for those of us who live as the gender we're born with is cisgender. And just to let you know, because people always want to know, that's a made up word. Cisgender doesn't mean anything. It's, it's not a word for something, just made up. And just in case it's, you know, you skipped over this part, not you, Rose, but and just in case you missed this part of what Rose just said, prepubescent kids, that means the parent has to okay it. And parents are doing it. Yep. They're doing a lot, lots and more and more. Anyway, yep. we turn to Google again and understand that it's not because we like or support Google, but you know, it's what children and all of the rest of us are using. And we want to be educated on what our kids are seeing and others. When you do a Google search on transgenderism, radical liberal site after radical liberal site affirming transgenderism or bashing Christians and conservatives for their bigotry, hatred, and cruelty is what comes up. This was the first site that came up, and I'm quoting here. It said, we are fluid human beings, free to change and evolve at any given time. No matter what sexual orientation you identify with now, 
it is completely okay for that to change throughout your life. It's like your hair color. <laughs> right? Yeah, I it's it is. It's it's not funny. It's actually very it's sad. sad, but you're right. The New York Post reported that children as young as five are being encouraged to disregard their anatomy and choose their gender based on their feelings. Last December, a California mother raged at her school district board for allowing teachers to coach her 12-year-old daughter on becoming a boy. They even chose a boy's name for her, and they hid the entire plan from the family. The Post also reports that a book that school libraries are offering to kids age four to eight reads this, and I'm quoting the book. This is Ruthie. She is a transgender girl. This means that when she was born, everyone thought she was a boy until she grew a little older, old enough to tell everyone that she's actually a girl. I gotta say good for that mom. Yes, good for the mom for sure. You know, studies have shown that gender dysphoria, a medical condition that makes people feel mismatched with their birth gender is extremely rare. Educators are confident that this number is gonna rise though dramatically now that it's safe to come out and transition at younger ages than in past years because of greater public awareness of the issue. Rose, if they're using books like the one that you mentioned and they're teaching elementary school children words like non-binary and transgender, even before they teach them addition, it probably will rise, but not for the right reasons. No. Not because it's real. Kids as young as four years old are being groomed that they're transgender. If a boy picks up a doll or a girl plays with trucks in the classroom, they're being primed by their teachers and school psychologists that perhaps they were born the wrong sex and would feel better changing. These kids are, are getting it from everywhere. And again, just to show that there's no logic, if they believe men and women are interchangeable, why is a boy picking up a doll mean he should be a girl? Exactly. <laughs> there's, there's no reason, there's no logic behind any of this. That's they how, contradict, yeah, they contradict themselves. That's right. That's why you follow things to their logical conclusion and they always fall apart if they're not true. Maine requires public school teachers to explore the achievements of LGBTQT individuals and not just in health class, but in history and social studies because they want their kids to recognize to be LGBTQT and it's working. Maine's Department of Education reports that 13 to 18 percent of public high school students say that they're lesbian, gay, bisexual, or unsure of their sexual identity. Now remember, we said earlier the national average is 5.6 percent, but Maine has it up to 13 to 18 percent, and that's because in school they make it cool to be anything but heterosexual. According to Pew Research, and this won't surprise most of us, most Christian and Jewish people say that whether someone is a man or a woman is determined at birth, while agnostics and atheists are more likely to go along with gender ideology. So that brings us right back to the statement that we made earlier. The radical left is trying to destroy the nuclear family so that they can destroy family ties and teaching and make atheists out of the next generation. And we definitely see this in research that's been done on why so many pubescent kids are experiencing a sudden onset of gender dysphoria. The conclusion is that the causes are social influences, maladaptive coping mechanisms, parental approaches, and family dynamics. So the very thing that these kids need, healthy social influences, healthy coping mechanisms, healthy parental relationships and healthy family dynamics, all the things the Bible teaches are the very things the radical left is trying to destroy. And they're having an influence on our children as the research shows. But how about after they decide that they're transgender? Let's talk about that. Are they happier knowing that they are finally the gender that they are meant to be? No, they're not. According to Forbes and other sites, 52% of all transgender and non-binary young people in the United States seriously contemplated killing themselves in 2020. And that number is on the rise. An LGBTQT website itself says that, and I'm quoting here, 
transgender persons are at increased risk for certain types of chronic diseases, cancers, and mental health problems, unquote. And the physical health issues might be due to the hormones and puberty blockers that they take. The left isn't really concerned about that, and they're not doing anything about that. But they do have a solution for the exceedingly high suicide rate. They made an app. They developed an app called Trans Life. And listen to this. This is from the Trans Life website, and I'm quoting here. Transgender people are at a high risk of suicidal ideation. That means seriously thinking about it. Suicide attempts and deaths. 77% and 41% engage in suicidal ideation and suicide attempt, respectively, which exceeds the general population rates of 9.2% and 2.7%, respectively. Compare those percentages. TransLife is a suicide prevention phone app that primarily aims to obtain preliminary data from user engagement to understand the immediate precursors of suicide through the assessment of behavior and moods in real time. So they basically try to gauge when it seems like a person is gonna commit suicide. That's and, really sad. And it didn't say what they do about it. It just says they they try to tell their the user, hey, you're in a dangerous area. It's just sad. It's, sad. The whole thing is sad. The whole thing is sad and they're not doing anything to help these people. No, we're pushing it more. Yeah. Candace Owens is a professing Christian who was a former nanny, but she's now a conservative commentator. And this is what she said recently. Children do not possess the mental authority to express a gender identity different than the one that they were assigned at birth. And then she compared children claiming gender identity to them pretending to be a superhero or a mermaid you know, it's an act of make-believe. And I, I think she's absolutely right. Me too. If, if they didn't know anything about this, these numbers would not be anything like they are. No. My son, when we had our daughter a year later, he was constantly pushing around the stroller with her doll. Yeah. I mean, you know. He thought he was a Power Ranger for two years. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, my boys were Power Power Rangers every day. They dressed up. It, they like the make believe, and they're gonna whatever you implant in their mind like that. You know they're gonna do it for a while. Yes, but it's just that it, it, they just oh, these people are just evil. They latch on to it. You know, when Candace Owens said that, she was attacked. She was labeled a dangerous hater, and she received death threats. And that's nothing new for her. No, I'm sure all of us know that transgenderism is directly opposed to God's word, which is what makes it evil. Again, this is not our judgment. This is God's word. It's God saying this. And we're believers, so we need to stand on the same thing. That's what we should believe. At its core, it devalues human life. Owen Strayan, one of my favorites, he's an author of Christianity and Wokeness, goes in great detail about how wokeness This wokeness, which has encompassed CRT, BLM, and the LGBTQT agenda, tweaks the doctrine of imago deo, which means being made in God's image, and causes humanity to lose the image of God as their identity. And instead, their identity is found in skin color, sexual orientation, or sexual identity. He says they call transgenderism good, perverse and deviant behavior are good, but call modesty and sexual morality bad. How's that for calling evil good and good evil? Pretty blatant. They're not even trying to hide it anymore. Mm -mm. And of course, the verse that Owen Strayan is referring to is Genesis 1.27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Our almighty, sovereign, holy, gracious God created us in his image. Now, that doesn't mean that we physically look like him. At creation, God was not yet a physical man. That didn't occur until Jesus took on flesh. So it doesn't mean that we physically look like God. It means that we are to represent him and reflect his glory. Being disgruntled in the gender and sexual design you were given by God is certainly not reflecting and bringing God glory. It's perverting the work of God and it's mocking him. Absolutely. 
And Owen Strayan has some advice on how we can stand and call evil, evil. And this is what he says. There are two ways to fix this. One, expose the lies and show how it doesn't even bring what it promises it will, which is racial equality. This is just Marxism and discrimination. And two, preach the real gospel. He continues on, the church needs to ready its members for civilization collapse. Pastors, get your people ready for darkness. Treat this like wartime. Help them build smaller institutions. Don't retreat, but do prepare for winter. Yes, we are called to be salt and light, but we have no guarantee that this civilization will hold. We need to be ready, have a plan. And they are sober words, but mm -hmm. God has given us a plan. The purpose mm -hmm. of transformation is to grow to be more and more like Jesus. So obviously Jesus would be the model for our plan. He called out evil, false teaching, hypocrisy, whenever he saw it. Matthew 23, 25, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Paul, John, Peter, Jude, and James show us that calling out wicked and false teaching is not only appropriate, it's necessary. And the other part of the plan that Jesus gives us is what he replaces false teaching with, the truth of the gospel. What do all the guys that you mentioned and more teach most about? The gospel. What does Jesus call us to teach about most in the Great Commission? The gospel. You know, it can be pretty discouraging to see how quickly the darkness and evil of the world seems to be taking over. When it's dark, what's most needed? Light. The darkness of this world needs the light of the gospel. The darker it is, the more effective and more illuminating light's going to be anyway. So instead of being discouraged by darkness, we should really think of this as an opportunity. That's a good way to look at it. Pastor Brian White of Harvest Church in Carmel, Indiana said, and I'm quoting him, faithful proclamation produces opposition. But if you leave that long enough, it produces persecution. But if you leave that long enough, it produces fruit. And that's the end of the quote. So what's needed is endurance. Now's not the time for the faint of heart. It's not the time to cower or cave because of fear or because of repercussions we're going to hear from people and the world. Now is the time to contend. In order to indoctrinate and control someone, you have to make them afraid. And the more fearful you can make them, the more you can control them. We've certainly seen that. And you definitely don't want people united. A united group standing together, supporting each other, is almost impossible to control. Just look at the convoy of truckers recently. All the parents rising up against schools all over the country. We see this. They are winning. But someone who sees themselves as autonomous and not part of or supported by a group is much easier to convince and brainwash. And that's exactly why a healthy family is important and why being part of a local church is important. You're gonna need these. God has given us all we need to contend in the absolute worst of circumstances. And he will use the evil that's all around us for our good and for his glory. He's promised that implicitly. Now's the time for us to be bold and contend. We need to not be afraid to call evil, evil, and good, good. We need to shine the light of the gospel in a dark world that desperately, desperately needs it. And most of all, we need to stand united in the truth of God's word. That's a good place to end today. Be sure to join us next week for part two, where we delve a little more into some of this and into other things that are being called good, that are evil. Have a blessed day, everyone.